So the question is, do you remember who you are? Think back in your life, think back to a time in your childhood when you might have felt a connection. Maybe you were out watching bugs by a creek. <laughs> Maybe it was just an awareness that you had. You know, there's that story, and I don't know where I got it from, but I remember reading it or hearing it from somebody where there was a baby that was born to an older child who was maybe a little jealous and had shown some signs of not being too happy about having a new addition. So they made sure that they were there supervising at all times. But, you know, parents get busy and they, things got real quiet. That's not a good sign. So they rushed into the nursery and just they, they hung by the door and they could see the older child saying softly to the baby, tell me, what was it like over there? I'm beginning to forget. Do you remember who you are? I remember when I remembered that I'd forgotten. I don't know how old I was, but I was old enough that I was having a hard time running, and I tripped and I skinned my knee. And when I got up, I was crying. And in that uh, crying over my skinned knee, uh, something else came up. A feeling came up of, oh, I forgot the thing I promised myself I'd never forget. I promised, I made a vow to myself I wouldn't forget this thing, and I couldn't remember what it was. And I didn't remember what I was until I was 15, 16 years old, on the way back from the Youth of Unity Conference going into my senior year of high school. And um, it was quite a week. It was a very powerful conference for seven days, and then we had a few hours before we kept, got the train, and we all walked into town and went to this huge Cinerama Theater that had a first week's run of 2001 A Space Odyssey, yeah. which is one of my favorite movies. And there were 11 of us, nine of us fell asleep. <laughs> but the two of us that stayed awake had an experience, and I had a spiritual experience. It opened me up. It was just powerful. How many people have seen that movie? It's something. It's something. It's a metaphor for everything. So then we got on the train, and about a day into the ride, I was sitting reading a, a comic book by Robert Crumb. And the comic book was uh, very metaphysical, of all things, uh, this particular comic. And there, a girl from another chapter came and sat down next to me and started uh, metaphysically interpreting the pictures, and, and very deeply. And it was, it was real. And I was just really taken by this. And I was just, wow. And so we started talking. It got deeper and deeper and deeper until it got to the point where... We were just looking at each other, and I swear, I knew what she was thinking, she knew what I was thinking, and then we started laughing. Just about that time, this one kid from my particular chapter came up, and he was like looking at her and looking at me, he said, you guys are crazy, and walked away. And so, but it was really, it was just, it was just intuitive something. And then she made some kind of a, a snide remark and then walked away. And I got up, and I walked between the cars and looked out at the West Texas desert, there was, there were just the Milky Way, you could just touch the stars. And it was like, I knew, you know how those experiences, I felt connected. I, I knew why I was here, I knew what was it, what my purpose was. I knew, and, and I knew that I had to start journaling, and I did. I kept a journal when I got home, and I had to really buckle down and meditate every day, and I did for many years thereafter, and I, I, I had that connection. I, and I remembered what it was I forgot when I was maybe two or three years old, and it was... It was who I am. <laughs> Do you remember who you are? You're a soul in evolution. Those are words. But there's an experience of that. And your desire for that experience, the desire for the experience of your heart is what makes it happen. Desire is the key. Desire is my key. Together, desire, desire is my key. key. So desire it. You say, but I don't know how to do it. You don't have to. Because desire is what opens up the door. I love this wonderful this wonderful um, poem by, by uh, Kabir, the great uh, Sufi poet. He said, friend, hope for the divine guest while you're alive. Jump into your experience while you're alive. Think and think while you're alive. What you call salvation belongs to the time before death. If you don't break your ropes while you're alive, do you think ghosts will do it after? The idea that the soul will join with the ecstatic just because the body is rotten, that's all fantasy. What is found now is found then. If you find nothing now, you will simply end up with an apartment in the city of death. But if you make love with the divine now, in the next life you will have the face of satisfied desire. So plunge into the truth. Find out who the teacher is. Believe in the great sound. Kabir says this, 
when the guest is being searched for, it is the intensity of your longing for the guest that does all the work. Look at me and you will see a slave to that intensity. The intensity of the longing. That is your desire. The first force. Remember we talked last week about the first force is your desire, the second force is the clearing or the release, and the third force is the synthesis. And I'm not going to go into that. You can watch it. It's online or listen to the podcast. But the, this is the most important step because this is the formative step, the creative step. It's not an accident that the daily word today is creative process because this is the creative process. It's all synchronicity that it's all happening here. This is the most important talk I've ever given. And I've given it before. But lucky for you, I won't be able to give it again and repeat myself over and over again. This is not just me telling the same stories. Again, this is the last time I'll tell the stories. So, so listen up. This is the most important thing there is. If there is any lesson that you can come, go away with, it's desire. How spiritual you are has less to do with what you believe than what you desire. There are thoughts beliefs and desires. Thoughts are important, but we in New Thought tend to overemphasize thoughts. They're creative, they're important, but they're no, not nearly as important as beliefs. Beliefs are thoughts that we hold to and clothe with emotion and they, make, they become a part of us. But beliefs are nothing compared to desires. The desire of your heart. You are what you're deep driving desire is. That's what creates everything in your life. It's the trajectory. It's, it's um, what Jesus called the pearl of great price. It's the treasure in the field. I want to read the quote that fell on the floor. <laughs> Jesus said, the kingdom of, actually it didn't fall on the floor, it was another one. And Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid again and then out of his joy he goes and sells all he has and he buys that very field. Again, that kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls who when he found one pearl of great price went and sold all that he had and bought it. Sell all you have and buy the sea full of pearls, Rumi said. And that's the most important thing. And you say, but, but I have goals. I have things I need to do. I, I have important uh, needs in this life, but Jesus said that seek first the kingdom and all the things will be added to you. This is the first great commandment. Jesus said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's a desire. He's really saying desire. The first words in the Bible are, in the beginning God. Jesus said if you seek first this kingdom, all those things will be added unto you. So maybe when you set goals, you don't set Ego goals, you said soul goals. What's the difference between an ego goal and a soul goal? An ego goal is one that is what I want. A soul goal is what's the best for my spiritual growth and for all. And they may be different. And you've got to be willing. An ego goal numbs you. A soul goal opens you up and grows you. And you say, but what do I do when I have a get a house. I need to get, well, I make my list. You know, I was get, try, had to get an apartment, so I made my list. My best understanding, but I understand it's only my best understanding. An ego goal is, I will have this, I will have that, I will have the other. But a soul goal is, well, this is my best understanding. This or something better, thank you God, I write at the bottom. And like I shared last week, I looked at a whole bunch of places, I picked one, it just fit everything I wanted in the middle of the night. I was meditating and it was, no, it's the other one. It's this other one. And it was all over me and I couldn't reject it. So I withdrew my offer, I changed it to the other one, and now I know why. One of the reasons is it's six blocks from the beach and I can go there every morning. That was more important than having the view out my bedroom window. It was, it was you know, it was my, what my soul wanted. But what does your soul want? Can you remember who you are, which is that soul in evolution, and that child in you knew, can remember, and can remember now. Jesus, that's why Jesus said, become as a child, because a child already knows. And I remember after that conference experience, and then I, I had it renewed again, when, and I've shared the story, when everything went wrong in my life, I had a plan in my life that I was going to take 20 years, and then I was going to go to ministerial school in my 40s. And it's been 40 years since I went through 
ministerial school. And then everything, everything just went south in my life. I mean, everything you could imagine. And I just sat on my bed, just feeling distraught, and I just said, help. And I felt this whoosh, and this feeling of warmth in my heart, and the words, behold, I give you a new heart, not a heart of stone I give you, I replace it with a heart of flesh. And it comes out of the book of Joel, Joel which is about the opening. And, and, and in that moment, I realized... I was putting I was putting myself off. I ended I I put my application in ministerial school. I ended all the doors open for me. It wasn't as convenient as I thought it was supposed to be, but it was perfect. It all worked out. So I awakened to my deep driving desire. My deep driving desire was in my heart. That's where you find it. And as as the years went on, I went into ministerial school. I was a minister for for 18 years in the year 1998, I was driving Jane Hart, my meditation teacher, into the gates of Unity Village. At that time, I lived in New Mexico. And she turned to me, she says, pull over, pull over. So I pulled over right in front of the gates. And I think that's a symbol, the gateway. And she looked right at me, right through me. And she said, what do you want, Greg? What do you really want? And I said, well, I guess I, I want to serve God. She said, well, don't you think you ought to get to know God first? I've been a minister for 18 years. Get to know God first. But I realized that I'd only been halfway. I hadn't, I hadn't put all my chips on that number. Know God first, you know? I, I'd split my bets. <laughs> Forgive the analogy. But are you willing to put all your, all your chips on G <laughs> or on your soul? Yes. Are you willing to put all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? And I looked at her and I said, yes, I will. And she had this look on her face like, do you really know what you're getting into? And so everything changed. And since then, it's been an adventure. And it's taken me on all kinds of journeys. And they haven't been the ones that my ego wanted. They've been the ones my soul wanted. Part of it was coming here. Perfect place for my heart to open, to love you, and to be in this loving experience, this wonderful experience. And, and for my kids and the family and the whole, everything. But it wasn't what I had in mind. But it was exactly my soul needed. And you'll find if you set that goal, that deep driving desire, the things will work out in a surprising way. And, but you have to surrender to it. You've got to be willing. So you say, oh, I don't know if I really want to do that. Ah, that's the, that's the test right there. Jane Elizabeth Hart, my, my meditation teacher, experienced this. She was working in her, her, um, her spiritual growth early on and meditating, and it came to her so strongly that she had two desires equally held in her life. One was to be a dress designer, and the other was to awaken in God, to spiritually grow. And she had them about equal, and that she needed to figure out which one was more important. If she picked the first, which was a dress designer, she would move to New York and become famous. The second one is that she would awaken her soul in God. And she realized, as much as she loved the creative expression, and by the way, don't think everybody's got to give up their creative expression or their livelihood, but in her case, she was taking all her time doing that, so she shifted and everything started opening up for her. And one of the things that happened was that her mother gave her a book that said, um, it was by Glenn Clark, I Will Lift Up My Eyes, and in it it said, if you will say the affirmation, I will to will the will of God a thousand times, your life will change and a level turn back. I will to will the will of God together. I will to will the will of God. Now you got 999 more to do. And she did that. She literally did that, counted them. And she said, everything changed. And I, these are little things, but they're a way to back up your desire of your heart with your will. And after that, everything changed for me. And my life hasn't been the same. And it's a great adventure. It's the greatest adventure there is. It's the whole reason why we're here. I mean, you're going to go through your life anyway. All the ups and downs and the different experiences. Anyway, you might as well do it for growth. You might as well take it all and do, let's call karma yoga. And karma yoga is, in the East they say, that if you dedicate the step you're taking to God and the, and the result to God, if you dedicate the action you take to God and the fruits of your action to God, then it all, it, it releases, I don't want to get too, to woo woo here, but it releases the karma of it, and what it does is it generates spiritual power and energy because it's all it's all for God. It's all for God. You know, I mean, these guys are going to make 
touchdowns tonight. Some of them for the Packers, some of them for the Bears, hopefully mostly for the Bears. I've got one guy who doesn't agree with that. But they always go, you know, like this or whatever. But they're always, they're giving their touchdown to God. And I don't know how many of them mean it. Some of them probably do. But in your life, giving your action to God and giving the results of your action to God. And then, so this is other ways of backing up this something with your will. Charles Fillmore talked about the importance of desire. I quoted him last week. He said, desire, deep desire, is essential for your spiritual growth. It is the onward impulse of the ever-evolving soul. Deep desire is essential for your spiritual growth. It's the onward impulse of the ever-evolving soul. But then you have lesser desires, material desires, material attachments, and at some point, it's good to let them go. Bruce sang a beautiful song at the beginning of the service about that. It's not the material things. I loved what happened in my very first church, one of my first classes. There was a woman I didn't know. She was 85 years old at the time. When she was 70, I found out later, she had made a vow that her husband had died, that she was going to climb every 10,000 foot or higher mountain in the state of California. And she did. And she was one of those kind of people. And I was talking about letting go and detachment. And she raised her hand. She said, three years ago, I had an apartment fire. I lost everything I had. Thank God for that. I didn't need that crap, and my kids sure as hell didn't want any of it. If you're offended, I'm sorry. That's what she said. She's 85. Give her a break. And, and she met it. She met it. My mom, she's 95 now, and she two years ago I had to let go of her entire life stuff in the house. and It was hard for her, but she's so grateful. In fact, her first week of moving into her studio apartment, she said, I've got too much room. Because I've got this entire building is, 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 is my living room. If you truly do these things with a spirit of detachment, now, I'm, you'll get what you need. You'll get the things you need. You'll, you'll do what you need to do. When I, when I made that commitment on my bed, when I felt that feeling, I knew I had to apply to ministerial school, and I ended up going in 20 years earlier. How much better was that than my puny idea of what it is my good was? What is your puny idea? And what can you surrender to, and how can you open up to something bigger, something greater? Because you are something bigger. You are something greater. You are the essence of life itself. You are a soul in evolution. These aren't words. This is the most important thing there is. So if there's any takeaway from any talk, if there's any talk that's important, it's this one, because everything else flows from it. Your whole life will flow. And you say, but I don't know how to do it. You don't have to know how to do it. You just need to want it. You need to desire it. If you desire it, then you'll find the process will follow. It's a natural thing. But you have to desire it. It's your desire, and then you back it up with your will. I love the quote from Paul. That's the one that fell on the floor. And it's a wonderful quote. He, 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 was a, he apparently had been in the Olympics. I mean, the Olympics. The real Olympics. He said, don't you know that the runners in the stadium all run in the race, but only one of them can win a prize? Run so you can win. Every athlete exercises discipline in every way. Now they do it to win a perishable crown, but we an imperishable one. So I don't just run around aimlessly. I don't fight like I'm shadow boxing. No, I drive my body, I train it, because I'm concerned that having told all of you about it, I myself might be disqualified. So what's he talking about here? He's talking about the law of attraction. We talk about the law of attraction. You've heard of the law of attraction. And it's often taught to how to get stuff. But the beauty of it is if you seek first the kingdom, if you seek your soul evolution, if you seek your growth, if you seek to remember who you are, then all of these things will follow. And you can make a list of your best understanding or pray about your best understanding of what your good is, but then you surrender it. And it's something better. And you might wake up in the middle of the night and be told, oh, you should have the one that allows you to walk on the beach every morning. You idiot. <laughs> what are you looking for this for? So these are the kind of things, because we, we hold ourselves back. Sometimes we play it small. Sometimes we have an idea in our, in our minds of what our good is. It's based in lack of self-worth, lack of worthiness, lack of vision. And, and, and spirit wants to move through us and say, no, no, it's not materialism. It's the expression and the result of knowing your own innate spiritual worth. You are that soul in evolution. And this is your purpose in life. 
So, let's, um, I'm, I'm just, it's earlier than I thought, but let, I've got one more thing I'm going to talk about before we do the meditation, and that is, sometimes getting what we want is not what we want. Oscar Wilde said, the worst thing in life is not getting what you want, but the second worst thing is getting it. Sometimes, sometimes we need to let go of the lesser for the greater. And so let's, okay, we just, we just go into meditation. I'm just getting, you talked enough, guy. <laughs> so we just, we just move into that place where our deep driving desire comes to the very front of our heart. We feel that deep driving desire. Our best understanding of what it is, there in the very front of our heart. This is the desire of my heart. This is what I want. And I know all the things will be added to me. I won't lose out on anything good. But I choose, I choose the one desire. And I let everything follow and flow. I move with it. I let it be a great wave that I, that I ride. I let it be a great force that moves me. My deep driving desire. My desire of my heart. Right there in the front of my heart it is. Thank you God, thank you God, thank you God. And so it is. Now I want you to take a nice deep breath and move into this now moment experience and set aside all the papers in your hands and become aware that you are more. You are more than your body, although you might experience body sensations when you pray and meditate. You are more than your emotions, although you might feel uplifted. You're more even than your mind, although you may get divine ideas as you meditate and pray. And what's left? Your soul. The deep driving desire to know your soul. To awaken as a soul in God. And we take these words from Rumi. Oh, listen. Oh, drop. Give yourself up without regret and in exchange gain the ocean. Listen, O oh drop, bestow upon yourself this honor, and in the arms of the sea, be secure. Who indeed could be so fortunate, an ocean wooing a drop? In God's name, in God's name, sell and buy at once, at once, give up a drop and take the sea full of pearls. And now take another deep breath and get in touch with what your desire of your soul is, the desire of your heart. It's not for material things. And yet, as Jesus said, when you seek first this kingdom, this one desire. All the material things are added unto you. What is your understanding of your heart's desire, your soul's desire? <clears throat> to know God. To love your neighbor as yourself. heartfelt connectedness in your soul, your heart. Desire is the key. And through desiring with your whole self, your heart, soul, mind, and strength,
whether you call it waking up in yourself, your soul, God, love. That does all the work. Desire does that work. So we take a moment in quiet and just remind ourselves of the who that we are and of what our whole heart desires and rest in that desire in our hearts. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the experience of my heart, my soul, desiring oneness, desiring upliftment, desiring enlightenment, desiring peace, desiring God, my soul. Thank you, thank you, thank you, God. And this desire is magnetic. It is truly the highest expression of the law of attraction. And it is powerful. It goes forth as a mighty beacon, shining. Thank you, God, and so it is. So um, we're going to take our offering now, and our offering is that affirmation, so you'll only have uh, 997 to do when I'm done with it. I will to will the will of God and I receive abundantly. Together, I will to will the will of God and I receive abundantly and silently. And again aloud together. I will to will the will of God and I receive abundantly and so it is.